and uh, I'll just let our speaker of the night, or one of our speakers of the night, give, begin. Okay, so before I start, can everybody hear me? You guys can hear me. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, so before I start today, I would obviously like to thank uh, Matt and UCI, you guys invited me to come speak. Um, it's my pleasure to come speak. Uh, if any of you have a chance uh, in your careers to become game developers, uh, something I would ask of you that I always really liked when I was a student is uh, when you learn something, uh, pay it forward, right? It's share knowledge, come speak to people that are trying, are interested in this industry, come speak to people that you know are interested in careers or interested in this topic, it's, uh, it only services, services us all. And then, obviously, uh, my company has allowed me to come here and speak to you guys, which is really awesome. Uh, Sony is an incredible place. Uh, and after the talk, if you guys would like to talk to me about working at Sony Santa Monica as an intern, uh, we accept interns for almost every season of the year, so please come talk to me. Okay, so uh, my name is Korai. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, this ominous topic called solving the game content problem. Uh, before I start talking, I'd like to give you some context on who I am very quickly. So my background is uh, I'm a senior programmer at Sony Santa Monica. I've been there for off and on about three years. I started as an intern in 2014. And now I work there on our tools and kind of a core technology group that's interested in making tools uh, and services for programmers and artists, uh, primarily people who make content for the game. I work at Santa Monica Studio. I work on the God of War team that you may have seen at E3. Uh, this is the studio that made all the God of War games, uh, or at least all the major console title ones. And my focus at Sony Santa Monica is primarily in animation systems uh, our content pipeline system and our content compiler tool set. And I'm going to be explaining what, what that means later. So before we kind of get into the meat of this talk today, uh, the premise of this talk is that in the game industry right now, we have a big problem. In fact, it's in my opinion, the single biggest problem that every studio faces right now, and it's the problem of data. The time to require, time required to develop games right now is increasing at a phenomenal rate. The amount of time it takes to create games. The manpower, and if we think about the computational cost of developing games, is also increasing similarly to the time. And yet, the unit price of a game, for the most part, has remained relatively stable. Meanwhile, an alternative universe, there's a growing expectation for graphical fidelity uh, in the games that we produce. This is an image from uh, rendered in engine <coughs> for our game on the PS4. So not only are the expectations for graphical fidelity are increasing, but also the scale and breadth of player experiences that you can have playing games. You may be starting to see a trend. Internally facing for me, uh, developer expectations uh, for our tools and our systems to drive content into the games uh, is also increasing. We want to have more throughput and we want to have uh, more interactive uh, response times. And this problem has culminated into what I'm calling the game content problem, which is that we have to produce such an incredible amount of data for our games now. And really, this is sort of a classic computer science problem, right? That's kind of what we're going to be exploring. For me and my team, who I represent, the problem has manifested itself in the form of impacted iteration times. So what I mean by that is 
uh, for artists, for designers, for programmers, even production and operations, people who are just interested in managing the life cycle of game and its development. Uh, seeing that quick loop of making a change and how it plays in the game is uh, becoming a huge issue. The two key questions I think about daily are when somebody changes X in game or in our content data, how long until they see the result of that change? And a separate question is when they make that change, how long does it take for them to commit that change? That is, commit it so that other people can use it, maybe even other players can play it. And the answer is, is you know, our desire latency would be instant. You know, you make a change and you instantly see the results, but that's not the case. Often the reality is that depending on the content, because there's a variance across different kinds of content, that time for both of those questions can be minutes to hours, which is unacceptable. And this problem is the domain of this lecture. This problem that we're talking about today is the topic that I would like to enlighten everybody about because it's a problem not a lot of people think about. And furthermore, it is also the domain of your game's pipeline. If anybody here has worked on a game, you probably know that one of the interesting and boring challenges that you have to solve is, oh no, somebody offered something in Maya, and now I need to get that into my game somehow. And you may use tool sets that allow you to do that automatically, but it's not magic. Someone had to really think about how that could be possible, especially in an era of so many different kinds of tools that are required to build games now. So what is a game content pipeline? Well, its purpose is to transform unmeaningful, in my opinion, it is to transform unmeaningful data into meaningful data. Often, that means uh, source data, so data that comes from other programs, into production data. Now, I'm defining production data as content that ends up in a player's hands. That is, you have somebody who's working in a program, the player can't enjoy it, whatever it is they're working on. It needs to be transformed in, only to, in order to become something that a player can use, right? Well, when I'm talking about game content, it, it's just so vast. I mean, there's just an incredible amount of game content. There's meshes, textures, animation data, shaders, materials, audio, narrative stuff, there's so much writing now in games, scripts, physics, I mean, you name it. There's just so much, so many different kinds of data that we have to get into our games. And what's even more troubling is that this data is often heterogeneous. What I mean by that is that it has each piece of data, or each kind of data, has a different intrinsic characteristics, okay? Maybe the formats are different. Maybe the quantity of it is different. And thus, uh, what that means is that all this data requires uh, different kinds of transformations applied to it in order for us to get it into the game. And from experience, I can tell you that data also often has hierarchical relationships. That is, when we change something, we're not changing it in a vacuum. It often has dependencies. And it often has a concept of something called, I'm calling content identity. That is, when we're changing something, it may seem obvious, we have to consider that this thing is a thing on its own, and it's different from something else. And we'll, we'll come back and visit later. So at Santa Monica Studio, our philosophy in solving this problem is that we can create the unified content pipeline and architecture at our studio to service this problem. Something that is a unified system that can service all the needs of the game content that we push through our studio. And it would have the following properties. It would be correct, which means that when you have a result that you expect, you get it. It would be expressive. That is, when we want to create different kinds of transformations, that's possible. It would be explicit, that is, when you ask for something to be made for you, only that is made, nothing else. It's homogenous, which means that even though our data is heterogeneous, our philosophy and uh, processes for transforming data are relatively simple and homogenous. They're relatively the same. 
they abide by some certain set of rules. It's scalable, which as you know now is a huge problem. Scalability should be able to scale to the smallest indie game to the largest AAA titles that you can imagine, just like God of War. And it can be debuggable. If you have these large complex systems, you want to be able to reason about what's happening, right? So, in summary, while we haven't even really started yet, this lecture is a talk on how my team thinks and reasons about achieving these properties in the game content pipeline. How we think about creating a system that can actually service all of these things. So the agenda for today is we're going to cover three topics. The first topic is something I'm calling foundations. That is, what are the fundamental building blocks of a content pipeline? The second topic is going to be the theory and architecture of game pipelines. So we'll look at considerations for when you're building a pipeline. What are the kinds of questions you want to answer? And I'll also look at a high-level view of uh, theoretical design that you have. And lastly, we'll be looking at lessons and current research that we do at our studio to solve this problem in the future. Um, it's no it's without question that games are going to get larger and larger. So to solve this problem, we have to meet it with probably some of the most cutting-edge research to scale to the levels that we need. And I'll also be talking about some open problems, something that you guys can think about if you're interested in a topic like this. So start with the foundations. So each piece that I'm going to talk about today, I think there's three or four pieces. You can think of it as a conceptual building block for a game content pipeline. This is a technical talk. But the main takeaway I want you guys to get from this is that what I'm really talking about is a model about how to think about designing a pipeline, okay? But I will show some concrete examples, okay? So we're gonna start from the bottom up, okay? The very bottom of your pipeline is the very top level, okay? So the most important thing is something I call the data transformation function, okay? It's the core operator, kind of like addition, subtraction, or multiplication of your game's pipeline, okay? And its purpose is to transform some unit of data. A unit is definable by you, okay? And its purpose, the operator of this data transformation function is to transform data from one state to another. That might be something as high level as taking a full set of data and creating a game out of it, or it might be something like this. So here we have kind of two structures that are kind of ominous, they, they don't really have anything in them. And we have a mesh, which represents kind of like a raw mesh and an optimized mesh. So a data transformation function would be something as simple as a function that takes a mesh and creates an optimized mesh. Another data transformation function might be something like takes a set of optimized meshes and merges them into one. Right? So that's the granularity I'm talking about. It's something that transforms your data okay, in a single unit. But it's not just any transformation. We have to establish some invariants or things that we need to be able to leverage later to design our system, okay? things that don't change. One of the invariants that we have at our studio is that all the inputs and outputs of these transformation functions are serializable. That means that when you have an input and you have an output, those input and outputs can be represented in lots of different states. They can be a file, they can be in memory somewhere, we can push them over the network, it doesn't matter. It's serializable. Another thing is that it's transferable. A lot of people think that these transformation functions, like if you have Maya exporting some kind of mesh, okay, that that's, that has to live in that space. That's not true. Okay? Transferability means that these functions can run in your game's runtime or your game's pipeline. The reason for that is because, in our theory, your game should be able to load your source data. All that's happened is that you're pushing your pipeline into your game. But you may consider that that's too slow, so you start moving parts of it into an offline process, right? Transferability, being able to run it in different contexts. Side effect free. Side effect free means that when this function does something, that nothing else happens. It's easy to reason about what this function does. It takes one mesh and it produces a different kind of mesh. It takes a set of meshes and it produces one mesh. 
They're easy to read about. They're side effect free. Another thing is that it's discrete. I really am talking about isolation here. Discrete means that when you run this function, it's a singular unit of computation. It's something that logically does one thing and it does one thing only. And the last invariant, probably one of the most important, and that you'll encounter in your careers, is that it's atomic. Something being atomic means that when we run the transformation, it either happened or it didn't happen. There is no halfway. And that is an incredibly important part of life in computer science. You want to have functions that it either didn't happen or it did happen. There is no halfway. There are no corrupted states if we can avoid them. So again, serializable. We want to be able to different contexts like memory mapping, a file system over network. I think I already talked about all this stuff, so I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit. The goals of developing a transformation function uh, or a set of them is really, if you can think about it, is to create a library. Of, you know, I showed maybe two very simple functions, but you can imagine that there's all sorts of operators that you can run against game data. Things for like animations, for materials, for shaders, for textures, right? There's a huge amount. But the problem is how do you define the granularity, right? That's the most difficult thing. And uh, for us, uh, one of our goals is we have to really respect the invariants. Uh, so, for example, when you're defining the, the granularity, you may want to base your judgment on the time and resources required to do that function. So, for example, if your function takes like five minutes to run, it probably needs to be broken. It's probably too long. For something to run on a single lane of execution for five minutes, it's way too long. So you would have to break up the granularity there. And the important thing about the invariants that you'll see later, later is that when we use this as building blocks for our pipeline, it will allow incredible architectural opportunities to make a great pipeline. So the next logical piece of unit is something called the dependency graph. It's not enough to just transform data. We need to also track the global state of relationships And there's really kind of two conceptual dependency graphs, and they're different in characteristics. One is the data dependency graphs. That is the relationships of data to each other. We're going to look at that. And the other one is the transformation dependency graph, and that's about when we have something, what do we have to do to get it to another state? So the data dependency graph is a relationship network of files. So you can imagine like you have a skybox thing in your game. And that's built off of one cube map, which may be composed of six one-dimensional textures or one cube map texture, right? It's a dependency graph. It's a very simple one. In fact, it's a directed graph. It only goes in one direction. And you're going to have this for all sorts of sets of data in your game. One of the, some of the properties that we want out of a dependency graph is file identity. I was talking about the content identity later. You know, often we think about files or data in terms of paths, but we're going to see later that paths really suck. And it's much better to have like a unified ID system or like goods. Another thing we want to know is the connectivity to and from other files. So it would be nice to know that if we had a cube map, what skybox used it, or what 1D textures composed this cube map, right? And reachability. Reachability would be able to answer questions like, well, if I have this skybox, does this skybox use this texture? These are questions we want to be able to answer computationally. The transformation dependency graph is different. It's a network of data transformations. Okay? So for example, if we had previously the skybox and the cube map and the textures, to transform textures into a skybox, go bottom up. We say, oh, we have a source TGA, which goes to a texture. And we have a set of textures that go to a cube map. And a cube map object that goes to a skybox, right? It's a network of transformations. And every single piece of data has a network of transformations that it needs to get to another state. And its properties are a little different, right? 
One of the things that you may have noticed is that unlike the data dependency graph, the transformation dependency graph requires computing something called the critical path of a directed graph. The critical path is the least amount of steps required to get from one point in the graph to another point in the graph. So that is you're doing a set of transformations to get to a result. It also requires deciding if a transformation must happen. So for example, you can imagine a world where if this function already ran for these set of parameters, we don't want to do it again. It already happened, right? So it requires some decision making. And also, this has to be performance critical. I would even argue that the transformation dependency graph, in its evaluation, is the key part of the performance loop in a game's pipeline. Figuring out how to get from somewhere to somewhere else as quickly as possible, both deciding it and evaluating it. So on top of the dependency graph and data transformation is something we may all be familiar with. It's kind of simple, right? Is storage, okay? So why would we talk about this? Well, what is really the purpose of storage? Well, it's really to provide both permanent and transient context for storing information, okay? The key thing is you want permanence and you also want transience. Often, when you're thinking about different storage, like in your computer science classes, you may learn about registers or the different memory caches or your hard drives or flash drives. One of the trade-offs, or I think the key trade-off of storage is that it's really a trade-off between latency, capacity, and longevity, right? So you can uh, imagine you might have an in-memory key-value database uh, or like a relational database like SQL, which is really low latency but has high transients. Or another example might be something really high latency but super permanent, like a networked file system like Amazon Glacier or Iron Mountain you know, file system records where they can store files for thousands of years, right? It's like the spectrum. And it turns out that storage and different kinds of storage are needed in different parts of your pipeline. So, you know, you need to consider it for where does your source data live, where do your intermediates live, things like communication in your pipeline, intra-process or inter-process communication, and also your production data. Where does that live? But there's a very important fact of life about storage. It's something that I would argue for that we have encountered in our studio. Probably the most important takeaway from storage is that in our opinion, storage should never directly interact with transformation functions. What I mean by that is, let's imagine we had that original function like mesh to optimize mesh, right? That function should not interact with the file system. It should do nothing like that. First of all, it fundamentally breaks our invariants that we already established. But the other thing is that it would be nice if the use of storage and the decision of using its trade-offs was orchestrated at a higher level rather than the functions that actually move data around. I'd like to be able to take a transformation graph and orchestrate it in a way where we can compute and decide about how to use hardware at a higher level rather than making something that's automatically done. So now we're going to build a little bit more. We're going to look at the theory and architecture, the second topic. Those are the building blocks. Data transformations, dependency graphs, and your storage considerations. So let's go into theory first. I want to talk about something called computational work. Okay. When you're dealing with an artist at work or a designer on your team, their iteration times, in their eyes, is purely a metric of time. That is, it took me, they're going to come to you and say, it took me this long to do something. I was trying to, you know, bake this new material out, and it took me 40 minutes. What's going on? Or, I changed the skeleton of this character, and now I have to re-export a million animation clips. What the heck? This sucks. They're not interested in the amount of computation required. They don't care. It's not very interesting. It's not relevant to them. But for us, that really sucks because often 
the work it takes to do something often takes time, right? Like you can't just shortcut life, like you have to go through it, right? I mean, maybe you could, but you have to do it, right? So there's mitigation strategies that we have come up with, and this is in the literature, actually it's, we didn't come up with, but I'm gonna talk about some of the mitigation strategies of how we thought about this, right? Of how we can sort of change the behavior of that work, okay? So one of the strategies, and the preferred strategy, is to change your data model, okay? There's a famous quote, I don't know how to say it exactly, but it's like, the fastest computer program is the one that doesn't do anything at all, right? You don't, like, if you do nothing, your program is super fast, right? It's like insanely fast program. So reducing the amount of transformation steps required to see a result, that's awesome. If you can just reduce the amount of things that need to happen, that's great, right? But that's not always possible. So what other things can we use? Well, we can also use concurrency, right? We're leveraging the invariance of our data transformation functions. We just said that none of our functions will do have any side effects, that they won't interact with the file system, that they won't interact with each other in any direct way, that they're not long running, that they're discrete, right? Guess what? You've just made a perfectly concurrent system. You can leverage all of those things to make a concurrent system that's so easy to reason about when you have no shared state. And when you do concurrency, you have a lot of different contexts that you can run it. You know, you could run one of these functions in a thread. You could run it in another process. You could run it in a process over the network. There's so many places that you can just push computation. And when it's easily concurrent, and the sky's the limit of what you can do. You're limited by your hardware at that point. And the other strategy is avoidance. Now this is something I'm gonna go into much later. But we have developed a technique, something called hierarchical caching. It's similar to how your memory works in an operating system, where we test different levels of caching, preferable from low latency to high latency, before we decide to do something. And in order of that, our caching strategy works by going to in memory, the file system, and the network. I'm going to talk more about how that works. The hierarchical caching is a very powerful strategy that I'm going to talk about later. <laughs> Another thing you can do with avoidance is just pruning. Like maybe you don't need to do this transformation function. Maybe it already happened. Or maybe you changed your data model and that pruned a bunch of things that had, had to happen. So avoidance is a really awesome, powerful thing. But it's not the same thing as changing your data model. Avoidance can be accomplished in other ways other than changing your data and how it's laid out and what it requires. So now a little bit further away from the theory is we're gonna talk about like conceptual architectures of a pipeline that you might see in your company, or that you guys might see at school. So I really kind of divide these up into two categories. There's really kind of like live iteration workflows and asset baking workflows. The analogy I would give is like if you're working in Unreal Engine, right, you can work in the editor and you can just play the game and it works. But if you want to produce any real data, you kind of have to do an asset cooking step where you cook your data and you get some kind of package of stuff, right? And that takes more work, but it has more permits, right? You can see there's a trade-off. So again, line iteration, you know, you could be like working in the game. Often you may have some other tool that you're streaming to the game. So you're working in an editor and you're streaming to the game. This is com common in console workflows because our tools can't work on the dev kit. So we have to leverage this kind of architecture. And it has some interesting properties. So one of the properties live iteration has is that you get instant results. Your designers feel good. They're like, oh yeah, it feels so great. I'm making so many changes. Until their game crashes. Because it has the problem of transients. Very often you may have your game state become corrupt, right? Or you could encounter an irrecoverable error. In the game industry, we like to turn exceptions off in our code. So you don't get a nice call stack, your game crashes. It's awesome. It also has the problem of when you make a change in the game, you somehow need to reflect that change back into your source data. So there's sort of this weird loop where you make a change, you like it, but then you have to somehow reflect it back into your source data. And that really sucks. That can be quite complex. It can also you know, be very different depending on what it is you're working on. You know, you're moving where a camera is versus 
editing a full material, that's going to be a really complex process. So asset baking is sort of the opposite, right? So you're using an offline tool to cook or prepare your data in some way, right? It also has some nice properties. So one of the properties, opposite of live iteration, is that it has permanence, right? So it has a really simple directional flow. Like, I edited source data, and I cooked it, and I got my production data, right? It's really nice. But it has the problem of being increased computational costs. Like often, to get that permanence, you have to pay something. You have to do something to the data, right? And in a studio, you often also have the problem of non-uniformity. And what I mean by that is to change your data requires vastly different rule sets because the source data could be any format you want, right? The source data could come from Photoshop. It could come from Maya. When you're inside the live iteration context of a game, you're in full control. You know everything. But when you're working with third-party formats, or even worse, a format one of your colleagues made up, it's just, you know, who knows? Who knows what's required to get it to where you want it to be? And it results in a much more complex unified pipeline, which we don't like. So why am I even explaining this? Well, We've thought about this problem a long time. And one of the things that we sort of realized is that we believe that live iteration and asset baking can sort of be reconciled. In fact, they're sort of shades of the same problem. They both have the same problems, right? You're trying to take something and move it to another format, right? But what changes is where you're doing it, context. So what does that sort of mean? Well, sort of the ultimate conclusion from this is that in a desired pipeline architecture, if you think about it, really the thing that you would like is you'd like to have a library of transformations that you can do, these operators, and you'd like to be able to transfer them between your game and your and offline tools. You'd like to be able to move them, move that slider. It would be really awesome if you could do that computationally, if it could be just cited automatically. But sometimes we don't have enough time or money to do that. So we may move it into a separate tool, like a compiler tool, or move it directly into <coughs> the game. Another thing that we want, clearly, is we need to know the full data dependency graph. You want to know the state of your data. That's a really desirable thing. If you have game, data for your game, it's not enough just to have them in similar sounding directories. You need to know their relationships. Because when it comes time to transform that data, you need to know what to do, what needs to be transformed. And the best way to represent that is with a data dependency graph, or a transformation dependency, or and a transformation dependency graph. The transformation dependency graph needs to be computable, which sort of suggests that it can't be a non performant thing, right? At work right now, we have a, we can compute the transformation dependency graph, but unfortunately for us, we have to compute it every time we want to make a change. It would be really awesome if you could have something that was online and iterative. Hint, hint, one of the open problems. And another thing I'm going to talk about a bit later is having a generalized caching model is really powerful. That is, you never do something you've done before if you can help it. And I'll talk about that more again. So here's sort of a visualization of what I'm talking about. Imagine that the top is sort of like a timeline of a content build. You have some source data, you want to make some production data. And on the bottom, you sort of have two contexts. You have your game content pipeline. That's somebody's computer. They're sitting at their desk. And you have the game runs time. That's the game that's running, right? Our argument is that you can actually move, if you have a well-designed system, you can actually move the lifetime of the transformation that need to happen on your game data to different places, like a slider. So in this picture, the green sort of represents the domain of the game content pipeline. So somebody's at their computer, they made a change, they hit build the game. So we look at their source data, we look at the data dependency graph. We create a transformation dependency graph that's evaluated and outspits production data. And the red is sort of the domain of the game. 
Maybe your game can just read production data. That's all it can do, right? But each of these things can live in different contexts. For example, your data dependency graph could be something that's static that you have to build. Or it could be something that's built overnight. Like you, your company has a server that keeps computing it, and we use that. The transformation dependency graph could be something that you have to compute all at once, or it could be iteratively built. Maybe you want to keep track of changes that they've already done, so you can create a subgraph rather than a real graph. On the flip side, your game could directly read source data, theoretically, and instead, all of this transformation happens when your game loads. So the point I'm trying to make is that this can move, right? It's not a fixed set of problems. In fact, we'd argue it's more like a Lego set. Like you can just put it wherever you want. It can live in any context, right? In my opinion, this would be awesome if it was fast enough. But in reality, most of our tool sets look like this. Maybe one day. So I have some lessons for you kind of working in the trenches and some current research that we're doing at our studio and some kind of concrete examples of how we accomplish this for our pipeline. So we're going to kind of talk about it. It's not every topic, unfortunately, because I thought I was going to run out of time. But I picked a few of the topics I talked about today and kind of how we tackled it. So for data transformation functions, when we were thinking about taking our old tool set and making a new one with this paradigm, one of the, we had three lessons that we took away. So defining data transforms, you know, discipline and respecting our invariants, and we learned that transferability is really crucial. So the first lesson, we actually developed an in-house object serialization library. It's kind of similar if you've ever worked with Google protocol buffers or flat buffers, but the idea is that you can take any C++ structure and no matter what it is, you can make a file out of it, you can you know, write it in JSON and binary, you can do whatever you want with it, you can send it over a network. This was the first step. Doing this was an incredibly important thing because it enables everything else to come alive. But you don't have to develop your own technology. Part of the reason that we did it is because we wanted some things out of it to help us for our problems. So things like memory mappability, you know, instead of representing a structure directly on the hard drive and moving it between processes, we wanted our processes in our pipeline to share address spaces so that we could memory map them and have it be really fast, move at the speed of RAM. We also had a binary format for speed and a JSON format for debugging. This helped us pursue some of the invariants we wanted. It also was designed for us to be able to play with data layout optimization. So if you've ever written a really, or tried to write a really high performant renderer, you know, do you use structures of arrays or arrays of structures, right? Who knows? It's like the unending question of computer science and games. But with our system, we could just try it out automatically. It has versioning and identification. It creates code for you. So we have, you get a full API for an object. There's no code written by you. In fact, there's so much code generated in our system now that I think it's close to like 60% of our pipeline isn't written by humans. It's written by computers. And this is like 100,000 line code base, right? It's amazing. You can just change the design of some of these things and it just everything just works automatically. And also custom allocators. In games, we're really tight-lipped and tight-controlled in our memory. You know, we want to be able to control where things are going and it's important for your runtime to be able to do this. Another thing in respecting the invariants is, oh my gosh, the concurrency guarantees. It's incredible you can just so easily create a concurrent system when you know things are side effect free and that they don't share state. It's a very powerful model. It allows for so many different state guarantees that I just cannot recommend it. And in transferability, as we saw in the previous example, it's really awesome to be able to move <coughs> a transformation function from your pipeline to your runtime and vice versa. You can just change context and even more awesome is that when you have that ability to do that, you can imagine that the evaluation of your transformation dependency graph 
can take this into account, you could actually computationally decide if something is fast enough to not do offline, but to do it during your game's runtime. If you could just decide that automatically, that's incredibly powerful. <laughs> and of course, you can, uh, transferability allows you to run in different contexts, so like a thread, a process, a network process. So the second topic was dependency graphs. What did we learn from this? Well, the first thing is that the most research is required here, by far. It is such a complex problem. Um, we also learned some big lessons in designing the flow of a network, like how you actually design a network and allow people to modify that design. And also, we learned about some interesting graph operators that we feel anybody could use. And I'll explain what that means when we get to it. So, Here's some open problems if you're interested in doing like a PhD or master's topic. Some very interesting open problems in dependency graphs. One is just scaling to millions of nodes. You know, the amount of data we require in our game, like we need to be able to represent the full graph of game data and do meaningful computation against it. And scaling to millions of nodes is a really tough problem. Pro tip, you can't just use an array. We try. <laughs> Another open problem is that, you know, to do traversal of a graph quickly, you really need to start thinking about sort of like an oxymoron. It's cache coherent spatial data structures. It's like you have a spatial data structure, but you would like to have coherence on it when traversing on it in memory. Like, that's a really hard problem. It requires probably some really cutting edge research into like topological sorting, and, you know, adjacency matrices, things like that. It's, I mean, it's a hard problem. Bloom filters, things like that. Another open problem is that uh, of iterative construction. It's very easy to build a graph from nothing to something. Like, you have a file, you'd like to know the graph of dependencies. Building that graph is trivial to do, or not trivial, but it's easier to do if you just do it once and you throw it away. A harder problem is that when you have a dependency graph, how do you in place update it when somebody makes a change? That's a much harder problem. To us, that's an open problem. We haven't been able to find any libraries that can do this really fast. So when we were thinking about designing the transformation dependency graph, we actually created a language to help us describe it. I didn't show it today due to NDA reasons. Um, maybe that will come one day in a later talk. Um, but you can think of it as transformations that we talked about are described as commands. So like a high level command would be compress a texture, which may be composed of 20 different operators, or create animation clip, which is another 20 different operators. And this DSL sort of allows you to say, by the way, I want you to make an animation clip when you encounter a skeleton hierarchy. Or I want you to compress this texture when you encounter a texture that is made. And another thing that's nice about the DSL, like our serialization library, is that it's a huge amount of code generation. I mean, it's like half of our content build system is actually just code generation, uh, which is awesome. Um, so now this is a little bit more computer science-y, but for any of you who are interested in dependency graphs, we discovered that when you're traversing a graph, there's really kind of two operators of do it on a graph that you can do that are really powerful and that can basically handle anything that you would want to do on a graph. So the two operators are something called reductions and maps. If you want to talk to me more about this later, I'm happy to. But a reduction, the way you can think about it, well, an easier one is the map. So a map is a really simple concept. It's basically when you have a node in your data dependency graph, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of that node with a transformation. So an example would be, you encountered a texture and you want to compress it, it's a one-to-one -one operation, right? You just have something, and you do something on it, and you get something, right? One-to-one. -one. A reduction is when you compute a subgraph as input. So a very good example would be, let's imagine that you have a character that you want to make, okay? The end goal is a character, right? Well, to make a character, if you had the whole data dependency graph, you would have to do a reduction on the graph where you capture things like all the meshes, all the animations, all the materials. You're collapsing the graph 
into sort of like a singularity where it's all of these things is an input to this create one thing, right? So it's a reduction. It's not one to one. It's many to one. It's a collapsing of the graph, okay? So we found that these representing these two operators on a graph is really powerful for us. So two more lessons. So one of them was storage. So we found that the Windows file system sucks and it's really limiting. Uh, you know, if you've ever used the Windows file system really heavily, you'll know that a path can't be more than 256 characters in length unless you have Windows 10 with the newest November update. <laughs> I only know that because I really care about this problem. Uh, now it's like 32K characters, which I still don't know why there's a limit. Uh, but that's, that's better than 256, but right now we have 256. Another thing that sucks about Windows is that, and just pad, not really Windows, but pads in general is that it's really hard to make things unique, right? Often, you're like, your naming conventions for files becomes insane, right? Like, if you imagine like you have animation clips, it's like you have something that's called navigation, left foot pivot, to combat stance. Right, it's like, it's just crazy, right? And people do this because there's like, there's nothing else that they can do, right? Like they just have to name it something unique. And if your name is chosen, you add a one. If that one's chosen, you add a two, right? Like it's, it's nuts. So the way that you can solve this problem, and a lot of studios solve this problem, is by making like a global asset library, right? Now I'm not talking about an asset library that's like a program that is file explorer. Like you open it and you just see the directory of your stuff, right? I'm talking about something that allows you to do very controlled naming conventions and uh, identity on your data. So you can imagine that you have this game content library. If you wanted to name something ice material and rock material, or had some crazy characters in it, instead of naming this on your file system, you could bind those names to a hash. And the hash is the name of a file. You don't, it's not human readable. Who cares, right? You're not looking at the files, you're looking at the asset library. So it's sort of like a layer of abstraction between you and the bad rules of your operating system, right? You can control it, which one, much more power, right? So that was an interesting takeaway. So now I wanted to talk to you about caching. This is the last lesson, and I wanted to explain what our hierarchical caching model is. It's a very interesting pattern, and when I, when I first realized how it worked, it kind of blew me away. I was like, wow, I want this for all of my homework assignments. <laughs> it's a really powerful model. In fact, I was going to do a live demo of <laughs> being able to com uh, con uh, sorry, compute Fibonacci for any number uh, with this model. I was going to bring like a Python demo, but I didn't think we were going to have enough time. I may share it with you guys if you're interested um, offline. So, but what is hierarchical caching? So, it's a very simple goal. The goal is, when you compute a function with the same parameters, never recompute that same function that had those parameters. You're, mem you're remembering what it was, right? Okay? This is only possible when your functions respect your invariance. Because if your function has a side effect, you can't just not create the side effect again, right? You're relying on that side effect because you have that function now. That's why we have the invariance, because it allows us to do something like this, which is an insane and awesome, okay? So, what is the hierarchical part of caching? Well, the idea is that, let's say you had a function that you want to cache. I want to kind of skip. You can sort of overlay it with caching strategies. So, before I show this, I got a little excited. Let me go through what the strategies are, okay? So, I'm reading my notes here. So, there's sort of like three levels deep of caching that we can do, okay? So, the important part is that we want to match a function. So, like if you have any arbitrary function, you want to match it with the right caching strategy that I'm about to describe, right? Caching is not like a magic, it's a science, right? You want to match something with the caching strategy that makes sense to that function, okay? So let's take a look at some of our caching strategies. So, perfect. 
here we go. So, let's say that you have a function that runs a lot in your program, but it's all done in memory, right? A technique that we call in-memory caching is something called function-level memoization. If you look, look this up on Wikipedia, it will take about six paragraphs before you see the most simple explanation, which is memoization is that when you compute a function, that you cache in the state of that function in, you know, in some place, in this case, rests it's in memory, and you keep that result, right? So function-level memoization for in-memory. File system caching is, you can imagine that, let's say you had a higher level transformation that did things with two different files. So it's a higher level now, it's not the transformation, it's something higher level. The file system cache is, oh, I already have those files on disk. Somebody must have produced it. I don't have to do this thing that's gonna make that, right? So if you have two mesh files that need to be merged into a final mesh file, well, if you see that that final mesh file is already done by somebody else, don't do it again, right? You're using avoidance to actually not do that. And networked file caching is the idea that, well, let's say that file is really big, okay? And we don't wanna store it all the, or we don't want to uh, have it necessarily always on the file system. Like, we kinda wanna conditionally have it on our file system because of its size, right? or the amount of time it takes to create it. Well, networked file, uh, networked file caching is where instead of pulling the file from your file system, you say, hey, is that file actually in our data center? I'm gonna download it instead. Instead of creating a file, hey, it's Joe Schmo over here who's working on the same project, he actually already ran a build and he made that file already. So I'm gonna download it to my machine. So he created something for me that I can use, that I need it, right? So we have three technologies that we do for this. So for in-memory caching, we use, again, memoization. I'll show you what that kind of looks like. But you can imagine it's basically a dictionary backing your function. So when you call a function, you store the key, which is the parameters, to the value, which is the result of that function, right? And you check that before you actually run the function. Our file cache based uh, caching is backed by something called LMDB, which has the most awesome name. It stands for Lightning Memory Map Database. And that is exactly what it does. It is ultra fast, runs at the speed of RAM. Um, it's really awesome. If you guys are using SQLite, forget it. Use LMDB. It's amazing. And with our networked file cache, we actually had a networked file system. It's kind of like a data center in our studio, backed by a uh, object store called Ceph. It's a massive program. It's not something you can quite install on your machine and try it out. It's, it's meant to manage, it's like a it's like an LMDB for a data center, right? It's a massive program, right? So here's sort of an example of like how you decorate this stuff. So let's say that like our operation our operator is this merge optimized mesh. We saw this before, right? And inside of it, we do some sort of expensive operation, right? It's something really expensive. Well, if we look at what that expensive operation is, we can see that it's memoized. That means that if we ever get to the point where we run this function, when we actually go to run it, we check to see if we've already done this before. And if we have, it returns what we memoized, right? So that's one way of caching. Then we sort of have another level where this function might be called by a higher level function like execute command, right? An execute command works on files. It doesn't work on meshes, but it calls a function against these file nodes, right? And it sort of looks the same as merge optimize mesh, but now it's a different context, right? It's dealing with files. It's not dealing with values or like structures, right? So a better strategy would be actually global caching. You know, if you have these two files, again, and the result is another file, well, just download that file, right? So they all do the same thing. They're caching the same sort of style, but the result comes from somewhere else. Sometimes it comes over the network, sometimes it comes from your memory, sometimes it comes from your local hard drive. It's a really powerful model, um, and I'd be happy to talk about it more offline if people are interested in it. But this has really saved us a lot. Uh, in terms of time and computation, especially 
if you can imagine, you have assets that have a lot of reuse, like textures, right? You know, maybe you have textures and shaders that are used in materials or are the result of a material, right? Well, if you have a lot of reuse, that's really awesome because once you've computed what that texture is, what that map is, what the generated shader is once, you never have to do it again. Even if a million materials use that same shader, right? It's a really powerful model. So what are the takeaways that I would like for you guys? Well, there's some hard problems in this space. So the hard, one of the hardest problems is actually building the foundation. Um, all the things that we talked about. Building this big library of transformation. It's difficult. You know, most studios, including Mars, like we have a long history of tools development. Um, you know, we've had tools, our studio's been around like 21 years, right? We have a lot of legacy code, right? And it's difficult to modernize or even justify modernizing the code sometimes because it works, it's stable, right? It's difficult. There's a large upfront cost for doing that. The dependency graphs are also another very hard problem, right? Because they're complex structures, they're spatial data structures. To be performant and do meaningful computation against them is a, is a difficult challenge, especially when you want it to be very general. But it's difficult, it's not insurmountable. We feel that it's actually a solvable problem. You know, if you can imagine a world where we can push automated decision making to caching strategies, data transformation caching. You have about 15 minutes left, just a heads up. Wonderful, I'm almost done. You know, if you can imagine pushing this decision making to uh, computation rather than a human deciding it, that's a really powerful idea. That's, that's the way that we scale for the future. Right? It's not getting humans to do more things, it's computers. Including some of the most complex decisions like when to do something in a content pipeline versus not. So, in conclusion, you know, the problem is data, and of course, like all things, the solution is automation. Right for everything, and it's not just you know making your program that makes a texture a TGA into your special texture. We're talking about something much more high level, something much more powerful. You know, kind of a set of operations and disciplines that we can move purely to the computational space, and that's the problem my team works on. Thank you. <coughs> Yes, questions. Uh, my question, it involves the switch from Greek mythology to Norse mythology. Was there any particular reason why? Uh, that is certainly not the topic here today. Uh, I cannot answer questions about that. I'm sorry. Uh, so you have no idea. <laughs> Just a lowly programmer. <laughs> yes, any other questions? Uh, thank you, anyways. Uh, I think mine is like, pretty simple. but. Um, how do you make sure that uh, when you're avoiding, your, that your avoidance isn't like um, picking up, maybe picking up <coughs> out of date, like, like it's, Right, okay. sure, absolutely. So something I didn't cover is during avoidance, part of, it's a decision, right? So that means that there's something deciding that, right? So if you can imagine, so the key part is how do you decide something is up to date? How do you decide something is out of date? Or more higher level, deciding to do something versus not, right? So one of the nice things about working with files or like any kind of structure in memory is that there's operations you can do to tell if it's out of date or up to date. So one of the things we do is we compute the hashes. So for example, let's imagine that you just have some structure that's in the form of a file on your disk, okay? And you know that this file is out of date because somebody just changed something, right? Maybe you're tracking it through tracking the previous hashes. Maybe you're tra tracking it through revision control, such as, you know, somebody has this set of files checked out and, you know, we're polling their timestamps or things like that. The idea is that you have to build a historical model of this data. So what was its hash previously? What is its hash now? So that when you encounter it in the transformation graph, right, you can decide right there, by the way, does this piece of data need to be operated on? And the criteria can be things like the hash, the timestamp, or whatever you can imagine. It can even be another transformation function. You know, if you had an object that said something like, like a mesh, like a full mesh, 
and it had an operator that you can do against it called is up to date. Well, that thing could do a heuristic based on anything. It's a function, right? So you can have the decision be pushed to something like that. Does that make sense? So for us, we move that to file hashes, file timestamps, and we do a lot of things to kind of early out when possible because computing hashes is very expensive, but we use memoization for it. So we never compute the hash of something twice. A quick lesson is something that we discovered is that function level memoization is really, really powerful on string operations. We do a lot of path manipulation in our build system. So we take environment variables, we expand them, we compute file paths based on parameters. If you memoize all of these functions, it's very powerful. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yes? Um, you mentioned that you're using a sort of a flat buffer test uh, serialization scheme there. Yes, similar. I have a question about that. Um, and I, I could probably find this out by reading more about flat buffers, but I think sure. ask you. Um, how, do you. Do you have to do a lot of fix-ups for uh, architecture specific padding, things that go on that's between struct members, uh, Indianness, so these days that's less of a problem. But Any, yeah. Um, things like this, basically, do you have a fix-up path that you have to run before you can remember? Right, that's a, that's a great question. Mapping, or how does that work? That's a great question. So, um, so binary formats are pretty tricky because you do run into problems like that. Uh, one of the main major problems that you run into is things like padding, right? So there's a couple strategies that you can do to alleviate that. So first, right off the bat, I'll say that Indian this is not something we really yeah. worry about. The reason, there's a reason though, is that because we're on a single platform, right? So we can take advantage of that. Now, pointers are, uh, and pointers to offsets and structures is a whole another research topic. Um, but what I can tell you is that generally we favor the computing, so we favor two things. One is very strict alignment of structures, okay? So that we can know the strides. We also do, heuristics on figuring out, for example, if you have a structure and you have like float and two chars, what is the optimal layout of that structure, okay? And when you do that, when you have a certain set of rules, you can make assumptions about what your stride into that structure might be. Also, we prefer to use offsets in our built data versus pointers. The reason is for something that you just mentioned, which is that often computing offsets is much easier to do, okay? When you're storing a number versus storing an address, which doesn't make sense, like you can't serialize an address from an address space onto disk. It doesn't make sense. So we compute the offsets of things. And yes, we do account for things like stride, for alignment. It's a lot of magic math, basically, to do it. But um, then in the runtime, or whatever thing that's going to load that data, we do a pass where, based on those rules, we can do very safe pointer fix-ups. Right? But it's I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's not an easy problem. You do run into that problem, and the, I would say that the trick to it is you have to be very controlled about how the layout of your structures works. You have to be very methodical. Yeah, th so obviously compilers have a lot of stuff that they've done. Yes. The compiler writers have figured, okay, we want this padding because it's more yes. optimal for the processor to deal with the plan's layout that way. Did you look at that as a guide for how so, you were going to lay out your, your... So actually, it was sort of the opposite, which is that we sort of view the compiler as a limitation. So, you know, when, to give you some context, like the operations we think about really is less about what is the layout of a particular structure and what is the layout of a set of structures over some memory, right? So our system is designed to really be able to play with that level of granularity, which is, you know, you may have, for example, in your game, a giant list of transforms that represent a skeleton, right? And you may have a giant list of indices, right? Now, the layout and the where those indices live in respect to the transforms, as well as any other sort of meta or other data you want associated with that, that is something that we play with, okay? So, we really try to make it so that when we have a particular structure, a set of structures, we can tell our serialization system to sort of play with the layout of these things at a much higher level, okay? Because that's where the real performance benefits are. That's another big argument, actually, for serialization, because 
In a normal game, or when you're coding normally, once you sort of define the structure of your classes, it's difficult to go back and rethink how that's going to work, right? It's difficult to go back and say, oh crap, you know, I should have done structures of arrays instead of arrays of structures for this case. Damn, but it's too hard to comp it's too hard to fix that now. With code generation, you can solve that problem very easily because you're overlaying different kinds of rules of like, oh, I can change this, I can change this layout, and I know that it will automatically account for things like, okay, how do I compute the offsets to things? How do I compute the stride of this now? You know, the entire layout has changed, but we have an automatic system now, so it's it's much easier. And your version too, so yes. if you change that, you know. Yes. You can still read in the old. Yeah, so the way that we solve that problem, and I'll get to other questions, is, this, is uh, our structures actually come with upgrade functions. So for example, let's say that your game is on version three, but you need to, uh, you have data from version two, okay? Or, you know, vice versa, okay? Our structures can actually in place upgrade themselves through a user-defined upgrade function. Okay. And that's something that is an invariant built into our serialization library, which is you must have that. If you have versioning against an object, you must pro provide ways to transform yourself to that version. Okay. And it's iterative. So it's version 1 to version 2, version 2 to version 3, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I have a question about the hierarchical caching. Yes. Uh, if you go back a few slides. Yes, of course. Um, you had tagged some of the code with... Yes. Um, like memoized and global cached. I assume is that some sort of like pre-processing step for when you're compiling? So um, this is completely fake. This is meant as an example. The way that we actually do this is a little bit more messy. Um, we actually, so our build system is actually built in Python uh, for the most part. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's mostly written in Python, but our operators are written in C++. And, or you can choose. But uh, the caching, uh, for C++ is more messy because of syntactic sugar reasons. It, it's hard to get C++ to do this. Like this attribute system in C++, I knew I was going to get in trouble for this because this is not legal C++. Like C++ does not support custom attribute things like this. It's a very strict set of attributes. In the future we may get that, but this is trivial to do in Python. Uh, so we try to move as well, a, a much computation of our build system into Python as possible. Because we can do things like decorators. We can do things like, um, yeah, really decorators is the model that we use for our operators. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yes. You said you use Python. Do you mean you write all of your build stuff in Python, or do you use Python as a preprocessor for C++ code? Oh man, this is a big question. So, OK, so, to comp so we have. <laughs> So we have Python, a Python build system, which acts as our orchestrator. You can think of it as living at sort of like the execute command level, okay? It's the orchestration of data transformations. It also houses our dependency graphs. We build our dependency graphs in Python, which we would not like to do, but it's simple right now. Our transformation functions, for the most part, we like to do them in C++. And we use Python's interoperability with C to be able to call C functions directly. Um, or we can dispatch them to threads or a, net or a, a network thing, things like that. Now, another question you asked was, do we have Python generating C++ or doing something? Yes. Uh, I mentioned earlier that our uh, serialization library has code generation. It's all done in Python. We can actually render uh, C++ files, valid C++ files using uh, custom uh, parser, lexer, and, and grammar that's written in Python. That that we that's custom, that you're not using the library to do that. We are not using the library. The library that we are using for the core rendering model of files is something called Jinja, which I'd be happy to show you. It's a templating engine, if you've ever used it. It's similar to like um, HTML or something. It's a markup language where you can actually templatize files and then in place render a file against like variables and things like that to actually create C++ files. So I'd be happy to show you that, but yeah, it's an in-house technology. I think we are out of time. Thank you guys so much. I hope this was an interesting talk. Um, let me take a picture real quick. Otherwise, we can come to a There we go. You can do it.
Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.